God is good. And all the time. Why was she speaking so quiet? Don't understand. Such a powerful things. Amen. It's, it's so, such a great blessing to be alive. Such a good blessing to go to a living church. Can somebody say amen? Let's give all the glory to Jesus one more time. Hallelujah. Is all the, uh, all the corn, all the corn gone from the lobby? Is there any, any more corn? All, everything gone? And so we have a, a young man, Uriah. Let's give him a round of applause over here. He came with his sister. See, our church is a blessing church. You get Jesus. You get healing. A lot of times you can get corn. You, get, you can get things. They're just, if you're looking for some furniture in the lobby, you can take that and stuff uh, but tomorrow morning it's already on Greg's list and stuff so but if you uh, have a truck you can load that free and it stood in my office for 10 years has a lot of anointing and dust with it and stuff and so but honestly I love our church I love the vision in the church I love our pastor and the vision that he has and the trust that he has for young people and I love all of you as well a bunch of you, you guys are just a bunch of good-looking, anointed, awesome, great people. Can somebody say amen? Put your hands together for yourself. Yes. School time. I know that we just had some problems with the school, Pasco School District. We are praying for that to be resolved. But the school has started. People have went to school. I know a lot of our guys are becoming freshmen. That yesterday were just little minions. And today they're just becoming leaders. We are really praying our teen home group that is becoming a youth service. Where about 20 people are beginning to show up. It just started with few kids. You saw last Wednesday, I saw last Wednesday service where the video they created, four people that given their lives to Jesus were all from teens. What we are praying for and we're going to be praying for specifically tonight that with the next four months when they are going to school that God is going to use them in a mighty way that they are going to begin to influence their kids, the kids in their schools for Christ to create peer pressure for Jesus peer pressure for Jesus a new way to evangelize hey it's completely cool because a lot of teenagers from our church you don't understand I don't go to their school but I'm kind of hearing rumors a lot of our teens are actually really cool in school like when I went to school I wasn't cool I was a fob <laughs> okay uh, I had the wrong hairstyle I had the wrong clothes they didn't match and my English wasn't good I, I just if I was inviting people to Jesus and if you would be the one to be invited I would feel sorry for you <laughs> because it just it just wasn't working really well for us we were going through the tribulation but these kids they're boxers they're very known in in their gifts and they have to use that as a platform not to promote themselves get the girls and get the Instagrammers and the Snapchatters but to get people to Jesus Christ peer pressure for Jesus amen we have to pray for that because if they peer pressure people into the gospel we're not going to have a generation of 18 year old 20 year old at the prayer line manifesting because they gamble into a cold or because they're addicted to drugs their problem is going to be they're going to be addicted to Jesus and bringing people to Jesus if we give them that vision guys if our teenagers will catch that vision to serve and radically pursue Jesus as a byproduct drugs teenage pregnancies dropping out of school you know drinking and all of these things that will destroy people's lives they're not going to be their problems their problems might be they get to church at four in the morning instead of seven their problems might be is by the age of 20 they read the bible 15 times their problems might be is that they already gave by the age of 25 they gave two vehicles away how did they get the two vehicles but they already gave them away that could be their problems and I'm sure we can have more problems like that in our city can somebody say amen let's put our hands together for the Lord and for what God is going to do in our teen ministry I also want to challenge and encourage each one of us our school of leaders on Friday night in a few more weeks it's going to come to an end and the people will graduate those of you in school of leaders I'm going to ask you that you finish your assignments you get ready for your exam and in about a few weeks we'll announce next Wednesday when exactly we are going to start 
it's going to start from a few weeks from now until the end of the year a school of exorcism now what this will mean which is just a fancy word to draw you in but what this is going to be in is going to be two classes two two lessons about 25 minutes each every single Friday before night prayer about the issue of deliverance freedom demons spiritual world and our enemy we as a church are in the season where this is we need to expose this more and more for this to become a routine once it becomes a routine just like prayer for healing or salvation of souls it's not going to be mentioned probably as much because it's just going to be normal but a lot of people ask questions a lot of people who watch our services a lot of people from the community they already know we're the demon hunting church it's a completely awesome name by the way we want you as Christians to know to have a foundation so that your foundation is not just based on what you see on the prayer line but it's based on the Word of God it's also based on the history of a Christian church where and how it all began and so that you will have a deeper understanding of what this is you are not too young to have that understanding and also so that as having this understanding the Bible says you know the truth and the truth will set you free so if you always wondered you know how could people get a demon how could people you know get rid of a demon you know uh, what about this what about that in few weeks on Friday night every single person is highly encouraged leadership is required but everyone else is highly encouraged to learn I'm going to encourage I went through this school I'm not going to teach it it's going to be a person who's going to teach it who in his lifetime has uh, cast out documented 30,000 exorcisms so very knowledgeable in this area very skilled and very anointed and so it's a 25 minute lessons back to back will be on Fridays before night prayer I'm going to honestly challenge every one of you to make it your highest priority it will be one of the best things you will learn that no other college will give you in a seminary because a lot of seminary stuff they don't teach these things nowadays well unfortunately a lot of people don't do those things no more but they will really really equip your Christian faith amen are you gonna go for that so really really praying for that in next few weeks that we're gonna have um, let's make our way to the Word of God Matthew chapter 4 verse 19 and verse 20 as you're opening your Bible there you know our relationship with God sometimes can have troubles as our relationships with other people I heard this couple who this man he was never happy with his wife no matter what his wife did he was always complaining and uh, he especially complained about the way she makes food so this particular time she decided to really try her best to make him the best breakfast she could come up with so he's sleeping she comes to him and says hey honey what would you want for breakfast and so he asked her simply he said I want one egg fried one scrambled bacon and toast so one egg fried one egg scrambled bacon and toast pretty simple she goes in she makes the breakfast one egg fried one egg scrambled bacon and toast he sits there and he has this grin on his face he's not happy and she says what's going on he said you fried the wrong egg it's supposed to be funny you will get it tomorrow because both eggs are to look the same sometimes our relationship with God and our relationships with other people can experience some challenges and we come to church the most important thing in church is to have and develop our relationship with God can somebody say amen to learn about our relationship with God and to develop that relationship with God so between us and God there is no confusion that we know what God expects that we know what he wants we know what he likes and that we know how to grow in that relationship with him and we know the benefits of that relationship with him in Matthew 4 19 and verse 20 it says the following then Jesus said to them to the disciples follow me and I will make you fishers of men they immediately left their nets and followed him somebody say amen so Jesus meets these guys who were fishing and he tells them follow me now this wasn't he wasn't talking about his Twitter account he had no Twitter account 
at that time. It was actually literally meant following him. And so he says, follow me. To them, this meant this. That means that you actually have to walk around him, not just observe his lifestyle, but literally be immersed in what he's doing. Observe it, imitate him. And then he says, as you follow me, I in return am going to make you into something. And that which I will make you into is going to be fishers of men. You guys are going to be working with people. You're going to be catching people. And the Bible says when they heard that, they dropped everything that was going for them. Now what I want to let you see here is they didn't drop their drugs or smoking. This wasn't sin that they abandoned. This was their business. This was their finances. This was their livelihood. This was good things they abandoned for something greater and something better. Can somebody say amen? Now let's take a few notes and then um, we are going to pray. So the first thing that I want us to see here is the following Jesus makes my life better and it makes me better at life. Somebody say amen. I know you're taking notes but you can say amen. Following Jesus makes my life better and it makes me better at life. The biggest hindrance you can have to following Jesus is trying to make your life better. Many people in this world today have a problem and this problem is not just their sin. We all struggle with sin. It's that in sin and in problems of life, their main aim in life is to make their life better. People try to change themselves by books, go to seminars and they want to improve themselves and usually your self is like an old duplex. If you touch one area you recognize there is never an end to its remodeling and the best way to remodel it is set it on fire and have the insurance company give you the money. Because there's nothing, you touch one thing and there's another, you touch one thing and there's another and no matter how much you fix, it still smells like an old duplex. God bless old duplexes. That's how your human nature is. Jesus gives us a guarantee. He says if you for a moment take changing and improving yourself on the side and focus on something completely different, focus on me. I will take on the responsibility to change you. If you make it changing you, your focus, you first of all won't change you and number two, you will miss me. Guys, if you want to change your character, if you want to change your habits, it's important to have discipline. It's important to go to classes. It's important to take books. But if you don't make Jesus the number one focus and the passion of your heart, you're not going to change yourself. Following Jesus makes you better at life and it will make life better for you. Without Jesus, Without him in the center, I'm not just talking about believing he came on this earth, but I'm talking about submitting your life and making him first. Making him your obsession and your passion. Sometimes it's hard because our sins, our weaknesses, they scream for our attention. But my friend, your weakness is a weakness. You can't solve it by focusing on it. Sometimes the best thing you can do for your weakness is leave it on the side as you focus on something more worthy. God's strength. Jesus picked his disciples. They had weaknesses. They had anger problems. They had temper problems. They were inconsistent. Some of them were cussing saints. They slept when they were supposed to be praying. They were impatient. They were proud. On the most important night when Jesus was about to be crucified, they played rock, paper, scissors who will sit second to Jesus. They were completely indifferent. 
yet not once you saw disciples working on their character. Disciples were working on one thing, staying as close to Jesus as possible and three and a half years later somehow some way this Jesus they focused on altered their character where they became pillars so unshakable so unbreakable that the Roman Empire and a Jewish religion could not crush the movement led by these weaklings your life can change if you stop focusing on changing it but focus on following Jesus Christ he can change your life maybe not in one day don't focus on changing your life make him your number one focus only then he takes the responsibility to change your life can somebody say amen number two sacrifice will make sense only when you follow Jesus the scripture says when they made a decision to follow Jesus they right away left their nets they left their boat they left their business they left their parents they made a complete sacrifice this wasn't giving a car or a house this was complete surrender of a life if you do not make a decision to follow Jesus, your sacrifice will be insane. Sacrifice doesn't make sense if Jesus is not the focus. And sacrifice is completely sane, normal. Makes sense if Jesus is the focus. Many people sacrifice things to become better some people will sacrifice bad habits so they can win a family some men will sacrifice certain things so they can win their wife's affection or so they can win their kids affection and there is nothing really wrong with that but at the end of the day that is not the best reason for sacrifice your reason for sacrificing has to be to get closer to God and as a result you become a better person if you are a sinner for example you are living without God and you do not want God I would discourage you from abandoning your sin why people who give their sin up but don't want to follow God why live on earth without following God you're still going to be in the same place whether you do sin or not you're not going to heaven I'm not going to heaven because I don't never done sin I only go to heaven because I believe and I follow Jesus Christ and you as a person have to understand God is not interested in you just abandoning bad things he's interested number one you following him which will push you to abandon bad things not the other way around where I abandon bad things and then now I will follow Jesus people who try to leave bad things first of all won't leave them and number two they'll never get to following Jesus sacrifice now sacrifice is not giving up sin sacrifice is giving up your life to give up sin is like give up in, giving up a tumor it's not a sacrifice you don't go to a hospital and say today I sacrificed a tumor you didn't sacrifice a tumor you saved your life yes it was painful but when you looked at that pain and the operating table you didn't have a sense of a martyr you were not in the hospital like a martyr giving up your dear life for the cause of your doctor if you ever felt like that it's because you had too much drugs in your veins when you were on the operating table typical person understands when they remove a cancer when they remove tumors when they remove bad things from your body though it's painful it's not a sacrifice it's a good thing when you give up drinking, when you give up drugs, when you give up that abusive boyfriend or that manipulative girlfriend that you got, when you give up pornography, you're not sacrificing. And a lot of times we come to guys like, I've just been sacrificing, just stop drinking. And God looks on him and he's like, what a fool. 
it's like a kid that gave up a razor from its mouth walks around feeling like he sacrificed you saved your life fool you didn't sacrifice anything so my friends don't pat yourself on the back walking with this pride before God that you gave up your sin and now like you sacrificed you did yourself good the real sacrifice is not when you give up your sin it's when you give up your rights you give up your pride and when you give up your life that is sacrifice what they did disciples that was a sacrifice what most of us do is not a sacrifice it's just God removing tumors but God wants to get us to that point where we also give up our life for the cause of Christ can somebody say amen let me let me make it easier for you to give up your life nobody likes to sacrifice the word sacrifice is ugh. it's just the moment, the moment you hear it it's, it's just not a good word unless you are giving something up for something far better amen before I got married I was in love with gas station coffee for two reasons it tasted good and it was cheap and I'm not sure if it was tasting good because it was cheap I drink that coffee almost every other day it was one of the routines of my day going to church stopping by at the gas station getting my little cup 99 cents at the time and I felt good I was a coffee drinker until I met my wife she was drinking some other hidden diluted coffee from Starbucks and I remember first time I went with her and it was expensive five bucks and I just pretended that I did this all the time so I just when she ordered I didn't even know how to pronounce the word latte or it's cappuccino some some other the other fancy words that they had so I just pretended I acted cool and I said make it too <laughs> whatever she ordered just make it too it's acting all cool and then when they said ten dollars I said okay this is official date <laughs> it's ten dollars it's an official date and then after a while drinking that coffee I recognized though it's a little bit more expensive but it's far better than the gas station coffee and it's been five years and I'm proud to say I have not slid back to drinking gas station coffee this is not no insult to nobody's faith here who still likes gas station coffee God bless your heart I know where you've been I feel you but I'm gonna tell you giving up gas station coffee didn't wasn't hard because I discovered something far greater at least for myself so is with life so is with finances so is with your rights when you give up things for Christ don't ever do it with a victim martyr mentality like you're like giving your life it's so hard do it with I'm getting something better I'm giving my life to get his I've made many mistakes in my life and I have regrets giving my life is not one of them surrendering my life to Christ is not one of them when I look back and see what he's done when I look back and I see what the vision with the church with my pastor what godly parents how they influenced my life being 29 and seeing my friends who kept their life instead of sacrificing I say thanks to God that he gave me the grace to surrender it it felt so painful at that moment but it rewards me every single day giving me pleasures and joys that other people are deprived of and keeping my life and I made mistakes where I kept kept it and done what I wanted to do it gave me joy for the moment but then it rewarded me with regret and consequences that I'm not proud of learn to sacrifice your life and learn to yield it to God number three an interest and involvement in saving people is an indicator that we are following Jesus Jesus said follow me and I will make you a fisher of man 
that means that by following Jesus he is going to make you into something make you into someone now you immediately would think he will make you into a better person he will make you into a person who is patient when a grandma is driving right in front of you he will make you into a person who is patient when your spouse cannot get that thing right when you finally you keep asking them or he's gonna make you a better person in school better person at home but Jesus says yes my goal is to make you into a better person but that is number two my number one goal is to make you into a person who helps others because at the end of the day it is our selfishness that corrupts the goodness in us and the only way to defeat our badness is to kill the root of our badness badness probably does not even a word in the dictionary right anyway you understand what i mean we create new words here every single time god says behold i do new things and so God wants to remove the evil in us by removing the root of that evil and the root of that evil is selfishness. Meaning God can make you into a better person without uprooting your selfishness. How does he do that? By making you be people focused. If you are not interested in saving other people as a Christian, I have the biblical authority to question whether you're following Jesus. If the church is not interested in seeing new people come to their to the church and seeing people give their lives to Jesus, if that's not in the bulletin, if that's not in the prayer, if that's not in the budget, if that's not the goal why the staff is on the church, why the building exists, if that is not the main focus, we as Christians have the right to question whether the church follows Jesus or sustains a tradition. If you walk into a church and you feel like this church is a museum for the saints instead of a hospital for the Christians, you have the right, this is the only time you have the right to question, is this church, not whether it's a Christian church, does it follow Christ or is just maintaining and entertaining people who pay the bills. We want to be a church that doesn't just please people but please our Lord Jesus Christ by focusing on people who don't know him. Can somebody say amen. Now Jesus says I'll make you fishers of men. In those days when people went fishing they did not use the line and fished with the line you know catching just one fish so when the men heard the term fishing they immediately in their mind they saw nets people fished with nets and they would catch multitudes of fish so when Jesus is saying I want to make you fishers of men what he has in picture is not just one person coming to Jesus not just one person coming to your home group he has a picture now and you do have to get the same picture Jesus has a picture of a net multitude of home groups he has a picture of many leaders knit together he has a picture of hundreds of people coming to his kingdom on a regular consistent basis can somebody say amen what we are praying for in our church is nothing new this is 2000 years old it's being consistent with the picture of our Lord Jesus Christ of seeing multitudes come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? It is God's will that the teens home groups will have multitudes coming there. It is God's will that hundreds and thousands of people in Tri-Cities every week will give their lives to Jesus. At Good News Church, at the other local churches, at the other Christian churches that focus on bringing people to Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? I personally, I am not one of those who likes fishing. I do like fish. I don't like fish. I like to eat fish. Let me make the correct statement. Because if I would like fish, I wouldn't probably eat it. But I love eating fish and I like, I like the way fish makes me feel when it gets to my stomach. Uh, my uh, bad fishing experience comes from the fact that I didn't see my father uh, going fishing regularly and he didn't really teach us so I blame it on my father. But I also blame it on my grandpa. 
my late grandpa we, we loved our grandpa he was a wonderful grandpa and he want, he had good intentions he really wanted to teach his grandchildren he saw that our parents wasn't doing the proper job he decided to take on the job of taking the grandchildren on one Saturday very early in the morning fishing and that's probably one of the most vivid memories unfortunately of the grand my grandpa that I have he took us it was my cousins all of us and the probably the reason why it was such a bad fishing trip is because it started so early and as a little teenager on Saturday morning if somebody wakes you up before 10 in the morning you're not going to be happy for them for the very long time and so we woke up very early I think it was five or four in the morning we got all there and I remember it like yesterday trying to throw that line into the Columbia River and I was trying to throw it and it would get stuck either on the rock somewhere there or it would get stuck somewhere else and by the time I would throw it in and then nothing would wouldn't have no luck and I would try to throw it in again at one particular time when I threw it in the the hook got stuck on my jeans so I keep pulling and pulling until I start realizing it's pulling on my flesh and I start bleeding and I start hurting and I came to my grandpa and I said I knew that we're not called to do this this is not what we're called to do and grandpa keep doing it keep doing it don't give up and so I keep doing it and then I lost my warm so I come to my grandpa and I said grandpa if you want us to fish you're gonna have to put the worm on the hook and I remember my grandpa looked at me with this he's like you dare to tell me I'm gonna put a worm you, you're gonna put the worm yourself and so and I realized you know you don't come to grandpa with these kind of requests and I remember taking that worm on the hook the worst part about that worm is, is it's a worm and it was alive so it started to move in my in my hands and trying to I was trying to kill it and then you kill it and the other side is still alive and trying to put on the, on the hook and it's so nasty and I remember it like yesterday I took the whole thing and I said this is disgusting this is nasty I will never do it again I dropped the fishing line and this was the last time I ever went fishing how weird that is that I'm preaching a message called let's go fishing <laughs> but we're talking about spiritual fishing I want to draw just few simple tips from fishing that apply to bringing people to Jesus now they didn't come from my experience they came from Google and they also came from my brother who goes fishing about twice a week and he catches fish follow him on snapchat and you'll see his exploits for the kingdom of fishing if you take notes let's just write a few tips down and then we are going to pray one of them is if you want to catch fish go where the fish is it's a pretty common but if you want to uh, catch fish you can't order fish like Domino's Pizza sitting on your couch and expect fish to jump from the Columbia River go and knock on the doors of your house and say hey here I am kill me fish don't do that fish want to run away from you you have to go to the Columbia River or whichever river that you go into and not only go to the Columbia River but you actually have to be intentional I asked my brother he goes fishing about twice a week and I said where do you go fishing he said Columbia River I said huh isn't that weird I go to Columbia River twice a week as well I never catch anything because I don't go fishing to Columbia River I go to see the Columbia River see many people go into college they go into their workplace just like I go to Columbia River they just go to make money they just go to talk to people about everything hey so you heard about Donald Trump you heard about that latest remark so what do you think about Barack Obama so what do you think about teacher, teacher strike what do you think about the Seahawks game about the Seahawks game man and so we talk about everything except Jesus Christ that's why we don't catch people you can go to Columbia River like me or you can go to Columbia River like somebody who catches fish we have to go where people are at and we are already there in the gym in the school in our workplace people are already there people who need Jesus people who are lonely people who are hurting many times people who are so expressive about their problems they'll tell you what they did on the weekend they'll tell you that the boyfriend walked out they'll tell you that the kids got taken away they'll tell you that they are on antidepressant pills and their insurance got taken away and they cannot get the pills again they'll tell you perfect opportunity to share a testimony but many times we shut our ears away and then the news comes they committed suicide then the news comes they fire them then the news comes they are in jail my friends if we want to bring people to Christ we got we gotta go where they're at intentionally people don't come to church automatically 
most of you heard a story many years ago there was one gentleman who was installing security systems in the neighborhood here in the trailer park and in some houses near it was late evening 8 30 and he needed to use a restroom he saw the lights in our building pulled in in the car with a friend goes to use a restroom while he was there because we speak very loud and our volume reaches to the lobby he was there using the bathroom for five minutes he heard the message of the gospel he was a pastor's kid who backslidden from another state came here to make money ran away from his family ran away from God sitting in the church toilet and here's the gospel <laughs> leaves the church toilet goes to his apartment on Chapel Hill tries to go to sleep and gets this heart starts beating so fast and begins to cry in his bed and knows he needs to go back not to use the restroom again but go and talk to somebody about God comes here we just finished the service walks in I think it was Bryson the one leads him to Jesus Christ and he gives his life to God you know how much that happens once in 10 years and many people that's all the salvations that happen and we pride ourselves our doors are open we don't lock them that's not evangelism fish will not jump from columbia river into your pocket and if it happens it's a miracle but that's not the miracles jesus wants us to have he wants to teach us not to walk and wait for fish to jump but to go into the river with intention of seeing them give their lives to jesus can somebody say amen <laughs> number two put the bait that the fish likes not the bait that you like i personally like strawberries but fish don't like strawberries if you want to catch fish you have to put the worm not the strawberry you can't put the ice cream on the hook you might like ice cream but it doesn't necessarily work for them one of the biggest challenges that we create and we hindrance for people coming to God is when we do this is when we put on the bait that pushes people away one of those baits that people many times put on is self-righteousness judging people and not being welcoming when the service the church setting like this a group setting is so not ready for new people doesn't welcome new people and you walk into it and a new person who walks in feels completely out of space i grew up in a very awesome church in ukraine um, and there's some brothers here a two and a half thousand member church a very large church two weeks ago I had the opportunity to speak in that church it was a very wonderful experience not because how big it was but because I grew up there and I remember standing there and seeing everyone there such a wonderful people strong families but in that wonderful church there is no new people why because it's very traditional everybody dress a very interesting dress code and new people from the streets don't wear dress codes like that so you can see who is new because they don't wear head covering and I remember I spotted one woman who wasn't wearing a head covering and she looked like she was seated on the bed of needles she was not comfortable and I can tell you one thing that woman is never coming again and the people who get saved in that wonderful church our kids from wonderful families and it just keeps the same cycle but new people if you walk in in the kind of wonderful church you immediately get a stare my brother did one kid didn't pay attention to the preacher for the whole service one kid did this turned around and stared at my brother <laughs> that just shows it's almost like an alien came from another planet and this is not to judge the church this is a wonderful church but this is to judge lack of vision because it's not just that church people churches in tri cities and we can be guilty of that we create our clique and when new people walk in we immediately judge or oh, look at their lifestyle or you should have known what they've done and everything you have no right to judge people who are sinners sinners sin that's what they do you shouldn't judge you cannot judge a fish for swimming bird for flying we should judge Christians for sinning because they shouldn't be sinning but sinners should be sinning we should not be shocked 
when a person who doesn't follow Jesus comes in and they you know live an immoral life or live ungodly life you shouldn't be shocked you're like bro that's cool that's what you do man but when they give their lives to Jesus that is a different story but many times happens I remember meeting with people and sometimes they say well you know I, I'm in a gay lifestyle or I use drugs or I sell drugs and in my past life I would have a heart attack but you do what never mind my mom is calling I gotta go <laughs> don't be shocked be welcoming that doesn't mean we encourage that lifestyle but we understand you cannot see people come to Jesus if we create a stiff cold judging stare you down you walk in it's like a scanner and then right away you take your phone and you hide your phone you're sending the message I don't trust you you're a thief that is not the right way and people will never come and people will never stay you heard the testimonies last Wednesday people who are getting baptized in our church were saying this I came week after week and what did they felt here now we cast out demons we pray out loud we do radical things but there's one thing that we promise you we want to maintain an atmosphere where every single person always feels welcome can somebody say amen. amen let's put our hands together amen. let's just quickly write down a few more things go where the fish is biting one of the saddest things sometimes we can do is when we begin to pray for people and we begin to invite people to church we begin to try to bring people to Jesus Christ and we usually start with our family like if you come to our church and you got touched you got blessed you go back home and you try to tell your mom you try to tell your dad and especially if they are from you know maybe a Catholic background or uh, non-church going background they're like you know great great and so they think it's kind of one of those things that you went like in school and it will wear off until next day you're coming you say hey mom I gotta tell you I had a demon come out of me last week and then your mom is like you said what came out what out of you and that's when your mom is like dude this is a cold this is there's some there's some witchcraft stuff right there going on and so and then you bring a book to your parents you're like hey you gotta read this it's called a Jezebel you're like okay sunshine you just crossed the line and then guess what you start doing after that and then you feel like the devil has risen against you and so you start praying and fasting that your mom will get saved and you keep nagging your mom for example or your brother to get saved that is the worst things that you can do for them because when you've told them once you've told them a second time after that you have to stop nagging them or your closest friends why because the more you nag and the more you invite them the more they'll push you away get angry at you and you destroy the chance of them giving their lives to Jesus it's almost like you have to put them aside and put them into God's hands keep loving them once in a while still kind of slip it in but not an every week or every month thing because you still have to sh let the light shine they see you every day but you have to focus on the person at work who just got hired and they're brand new in town they don't know no one you have to focus in the cafeteria in school and someone who is loner and nobody ever sits with them those are your people can somebody say amen you know when Jesus started his ministry walking around saying I'm a Messiah you think his mom and his brothers came in with the gifts and say we always knew that we always knew that no they came with bodyguards and the Bible says they came stopped Jesus meeting and they said Jesus we came to take you back home you're out of your mind imagine that can you imagine the insult when your own family does not believe you're the Messiah Jesus could have easily said okay guys I'm shutting down my Jesus Christ Nazareth ministry association and I'm gonna go try to fix my family first I come back to you in about 25 years no the Bible says he just looked at his family he said hey guys I love you guys I will always do I will always be there but I gotta keep on keeping on and three years later guess who's the pastor at Jerusalem church James the brother of Jesus where is the mother of Jesus when Jesus left 50 days later she's in the room praying to Jesus how did God change their hearts when Jesus didn't obsess with their rejection but he kept on reaching other people and God went and changed their life can somebody say amen God will save your family God will touch your closest friends but don't stop on them obsess and focus on others who don't know Jesus yet can somebody say amen we have a lot more things to share but I think that's 
good for now and we're going to come to a point right now of asking the Lord to give us the burden give us the desire and help us to be people who are fishers of men in Jesus name amen let's rise to our feet